with everyone. I don't really do much outside of work and school, so naturally I'm going to talk about school. Um, work, not school, but equally as important though. Um, something that I, I'm a certified pharmacy technician, and we get a lot of phone calls at the pharmacy I work at. And one of the common ones is, "Can I, if I bring my medication to you, can you throw it away for me?" The short answer to that is no. But if you're like everyone else in the world, you probably have a medicine cabinet that is slammed full of unused medications, whether it was like a pain reliever that you got for a surgery or something, and you ended up not needing it, or it's just something that you decided you weren't going to take. This is really dangerous to have in your house, whether you have small kids or teenagers, because they're both equally curious and they want to see what they can get into. And the study from the National Institute of Drug Abuse revealed that the abuse of prescription drugs affects young, adult, uh, young adults most. They found that young adults age 18 to 25 are the biggest abusers of prescription opioid pain relievers, ADHD stimulants, and anti-anxiety drugs. They do it for all different reasons, but including to get high or because they think the prescription stimulants will help them study better, but it's still dangerous. In 2014, more than 1,700 young adults died from prescription drug, mainly opioid overdoses, more than died from overdoses of any other drug, including heroin and cocaine combined, and many more needed emergency treatment. If you look at this chart right here on the left side, you can see that in the past year, 6% of those 12 to 17 reported abusing prescription drugs, 12% of those age 18 to 25, and 5% of those 26 and older. This concluded that the non-medical use of prescription drugs was highest among young adults. Among young adults, for every death due to prescription drug overdose, there were 119 emergency room visits and 22 treatment admissions. You're probably wondering now, how can I get rid of these prescription drugs that I have just laying around in my house? The first one that we're going to talk about is the medication drop boxes. We've actually got two of these in Athens. There's one at the UGA Police Department, as well as the police department for the athens Clark County on the east side. Before you use these, according to the FDA, you want to make sure that you remove all of your like patient identifiers, your prescription number, your name, address, phone number, anything like that. If that information were to get into the wrong hands, they can actually go through and refill your medication and they have all the information they need to refill it and pick it up. And then they have your prescription. Now, if you don't live in Athens, you can actually go on to Google Maps and search drug disposal and it will pull up a list of them near you. You can see there's one between Munro and Snellville. There's two in Athens one in Banks County, Livonia, Cannon, the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office, and then the Warren County Sheriff's Office. A lot of people don't really want to go out of their way to go to the police station to drop them off so they can actually get, partake in the National Drug Take Back Day. The pharmacy that I work at, we usually do two of them a year. Most pharmacies, I think, just do the one on October 26th. There was supposed to be one on April 25th, I believe, but that one was canceled due to COVID. This picture is actually from October 26th. It's a local partnership between the police department and pharmacies. The pharmacies kind of organize it and promote it, advertise, and then the police departments kind of come in, take over, and then we're just there to assist them. Nationwide for the October 26th date, it, they took in over 800,000 pounds, close to 900,000 pounds, while Georgia only counted for 5,900 of that. So Georgia definitely has some work to do. You can actually go and pull up some more information about this down there at the takebackday.dea.gov. A lot of people are kind of skeptical about getting a bag of medications and bringing them to the grocery store with them. Although it's more convenient, they don't really want to be seen in public with a bag full of medications. They, don't, they think that someone might kind of attack them and take it and things like that. So there's actually an option that's safer for them, and they can kind of take charge of their own you know, disposal and use DisposeRx. This is something that a lot of pharmacies offer for free. I know we offer it for free at Kroger where I work. I want to say Walmart offers them for free as well. All you have to do is add water, the powder, shake it up, and you're good to go. If you want to know how to do it, I actually have a video that we can watch. Meet, dispose up. That's okay, I'm pausing your time here. Okay. You might need to hit escape to get out of your, uh, your window, your presentation window.
Let's see. I hit a new share and it still says that it is paused. Oh, it, it says what's paused? My screen sharing is paused after I hit new share and then clicked on the new window. Okay, let's see. Let me let me get you out of this. Okay, and all right, now go ahead and try it. There you go. Okay, there we go. Meet DisposeRx, the future of drug disposal. Using DisposeRx is as easy as one, two, three. Open the vial of pills. Fill to two thirds full with warm water. Add the DisposeRx powder and shake vigorously for about 30 seconds. Almost immediately, you'll notice that you can no longer hear the pills rattling inside the bottle. They're being sequestered by a patented blend of cross-linking polymers that renders the drugs unretrievable for all practical purposes. DisposeRx is environmentally friendly and can be tossed in the household trash. The future of drug disposal is here. So, when it times come to clean up that medicine cabinet, don't simply flush them down the drain. According to a study by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, it found that medicines flushed down the drain can contaminate our lakes and streams, which, which can hurt fish and other aquatic wildlife, and eventually end up in our drinking water. Would you want to drink something that your neighbors flushed down the toilet? I didn't think so. <laughs> and there's my work cited. And is there any questions? All right, does anyone have any questions for Jonah? All right, let me ask a question. Um, what, is, what is the danger of flushing your medications down the drain? One of the things that I found that kind of stuck out to me was all the synthetic hormones and stuff that people take. And when it ends up in your water supply and then you end up drinking it, then you're kind of ingesting all those extra hormones and they can actually they mess kind of like with the breeding patterns of the fish, according to one study. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I mean, that's not excellent. <laughs> that was a good answer to the question. Thank you so much, Jonah. Great job. Thank you. All right. Brenda, you're up next. Okay. If I can get this to share. Sure thing. There, can you see it? We can see it. All right. So a big thing around my house is heart problems. I have heart problems, my husband does. So I did mine on ICDs, the internal cardio defibrillator, jumpstart your heart. Um, the thing about mine is it's been something I've had since I was born. And I always wondered, would you want your per your loved one to have an internal cardio defibrillator if you thought they had a problem and how does it work? It was all questions that ran through my head when I was dealing with this for the last 25 years and trying to figure out what was going on. So some of the sudden cardiac arrest statistics are, I got these from the American Heart Association and they estimate, suggest that incidences of out of hospital cardiac arrest among adults is 347,000 a year. And according to the 2017 figures from the CDC, sudden cardiac death appears among multiple causes of death on 13.5% of death certificates in the United States. So one out of every seven people will die from sudden cardiac death. That was a scary thought to me. And I found this video, if I could get it to play. All right, hey Brenda. Yes. So let me, let's see if I can do this. I'm gonna stop your screen sharing for a second. Okay. And, and I want to, oops, 
I didn't mean to pull that up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, uh, okay. So when we, when we do share screen or when you guys mm -hmm. click on share screen, this is for everyone. Um, at the, and it's my problem. I should have brought this up. I should have mentioned this and I didn't. So um, in case you don't know, when you do share screen at the bottom left-hand corner of your window, there should be an option for share computer sound. Um, and so that's what you want to make sure you click on um, when you do share screen. And what that will do is it will allow you to share um, any audio that's coming into your computer for okay. videos that you're playing. Okay. By the way, I paused your time. So none of this I'm counts. Just you, you there could it just, is. Yeah. You okay. could just pick it up with playing of the video and I'll start the timer again. Okay. I clicked the little share sound thing. So maybe it'll work now. Iver, thanks to what happened Perfect. next. The Fox Medical Team's Beth Galvin is here now with more of Claire's story. Sudden cardiac death. Yeah, that is so scary. Claire is a rare survivor thanks to what happened next. The Fox Medical Team's Beth Galvin is here now with more of Claire's story. Beth and and Tom, it is really hard for Claire and her parents to watch this video, but they're sharing it publicly to show people how important it is to get trained in CPR and to know how to use an AED. Claire had experienced shoulder pain for a couple of years, but her doctors never suspected her heart, and no one expected this. I was like right about here, and then I staggered a couple steps. 17-year-old Claire Crawford is the girl in the video, the one whose heart suddenly stops. Well, I feel nauseous watching it because it's a little scary. It happened here in the gym at Loganville Christian Academy during an October volleyball match. It was senior night. Claire's parents, Eric and Lisa, had set up a video camera across the gym. It was up, up, up on the stage. You don't expect that it's going to happen at your school, right, literally right in front of you. I had just started and then I'd set, set the ball up and then move back and then I just remember feeling like I was about to pass out. Claire grabs her chest, then hits the floor in full cardiac arrest. Terrified. Terrified. The camera's still rolling. Claire is surrounded. You're very nervous. You're not sure what to do. You're not sure what you're seeing. Julie Sermons. Is I'm not going to show the whole thing because it will take forever. But um, what happened was they ended up having to use the AED on her and it told them how to work the, the AED. They placed it on her chest, the two pads, and they brought her back to life. She is now the proud recipient of a defibrillator. And this happens a lot with young athletes. They've found in the last couple of years that young athletes have a lot of heart problems that people don't expect because they're in shape and they don't understand why. I looked up and found some of the main reasons for patients to have defibrillators. Mine started off with AFib when I was in my 20s. I had my first son at 18 and it put a lot of stress on my heart. So I would have passing out spells and just, it was even hard to go to work because I never knew what would happen. I would just pass out. But ventricular fibrillation, signs and symptoms are near fainting or dizziness, fainting, acute shortness of breath, which is a sudden onset of a shortness of breath and just simple cardiac arrest. The next mean leading reason for an ICD is ventricular tachycardia. Palpitations is what I had where your heart just races constantly. Mine felt like I was always running a marathon. I never felt like my heart was slowing down. It was, it was weird. It puts you out of breath a lot. Chest pain, lightheadedness, unconsciousness, the third reason why they do the ICD can be a congenital heart disease or a heart defect, an irregular heartbeat, cyanosis. If you have a bluish colored skin or lips or nails, that could be a sign that your heart is not pumping correctly. Becoming tired too quickly on exertion, like if you go and do a, a workout and all of a sudden you're just out of breath really fast even though you just started. Swelling of your tissues or organs. My hands and my feet swell for no reason. Just be sitting there and they'll swell up and that's part of my congenital defect. <clears throat> Next question most people ask is, how do they implant the monitor, the defibrillator? For women, they usually do it in your chest, right below your collarbone. And then the two leads go into your, your artery and down into the bottom chamber of your heart. This is usually how they do the women's. 
And then on men, they found out that putting it under their underarm is actually better for them because men don't have as much tissue on their chest as women do. And they don't do this in women usually because bras. Simple, simply put, women's bras just tend to irritate it. I've known some women that had it put there and they've had to go back in and have it removed. They make a slice in your chest and make a pocket under the muscle and they just push it in there and then run the two leads into your heart. <clears throat> My biggest question was, how bad is this gonna hurt if it ever has to go off? Which I'm on medicine and it's never had to go off. I've had it for, in December will be two years. But the doctor explained to me, feel like a donkey has kicked you in your chest if it ever goes off. So I'm praying it never does. And it will last, he said, if it never has to go off, it will last up to 10 years or so. Because it's not like a pacemaker where it is constantly having to work. It's just monitoring it. And here's a little video of the guy explaining how it works. So your doctor told you that you need to have a defibrillator or commonly known as ICD, implantable cardioverter defibrillator. While, while a pacemaker prevents your heartbeat from going low, below a certain point, the defibrillator actually will prevent your heartbeat from going very fast or actually will put your heartbeat back into normal rhythm when it senses that it has gone very fast. Well, why is that? Because if your heartbeat is to go dangerously fast, very, very fast, to the point where you might actually pass out or have a sudden cardiac arrest, then the defibrillator is monitoring your heartbeat every single second of the day. And if it sees that your heart has gone very fast, it will deliver an electric shock to put you back into normal rhythm. Similar to what you see on TV with those emergency room uh, 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 paddles where they shock the patient, that's the same exact mechanism, but this one is actually implanted in your shoulder with the wire inside your heart. How does it work? Well, if this is the patient here, and the heart is right over here, what we do is we put the defibrillator right over the shoulder, and then there's a vein that goes right under the collarbone where we put the wire, and the wire goes all the way inside the heart. Now, if you look at this wire, the wire has a coil on it that is connected to the defibrillator. And what the defibrillator does is that it delivers an electrical current between the coils and the defibrillator can. And that electrical impulse traverses the heart and wipes out the fast heart rhythm and puts the heart back into normal rhythm. Usually the patient will feel a shock. And the typical description is that a mule kicked me in the chest. But it will prevent you from passing out. And also, most importantly, it will abort an episode of sudden arrest or sudden death. So, so you're I've never had to have mine go off, but I know if it was my loved one and I researched this like crazy before I said, yes, let's go ahead and put this in because I was scared. If it was my loved one, I would want them to do it. And there's my work cited page. Thank you, Brenda. I do have a Hold question. Up. Yes. What, what is the difference between like someone having a pacemaker or someone having um, this device inserted? Okay, the pacemaker is actually, it's a smaller device. And what it does is I have a friend who has one and his heart, you know, doesn't pump and beat fast enough. It runs too slow. So the pacemaker sets the pace and it runs constantly to make his heart beat faster. Where mine keeps it to where if it does race out of control, it will shock it and put it back into a normal rhythm. Very cool. Thank you. Any other questions? A question. Okay. So um, what are the general warning signs that, like if someone passes out in front of you, how do you know when to use the AED machine versus something else, if, I guess? If they're laying down and they're not breathing and you don't feel a pulse, you need to start CPR right away and call 911. They will ask you exactly what all symptoms you are seeing and more than likely an AED is going to be needed. Okay. So is this something that only a like professional, someone who knows, like has been trained to use it should try to use? Actually an AED has all of the instructions inside of it and it tells you on the pads where to put them 
and then the monitor, the AED actually talks you through every step. It tells you how, if you should shock, it will actually read the heart and tell you if you should shock or not. If you shouldn't, you just keep doing compressions. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. I'm actually reading uh, the autobiography of Slash, legendary yeah. guitarist for Guns N' Roses. And his book opens up in the introduction with him being on stage and he said, he felt it. He felt that goat kick him in the chest. Mm -hmm. because he he, uh, he has one and for very different reasons. A lot of drinking, a lot of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Stephanie, you're up. Okay. Let me turn off that. Sure thing. Really loud. Okay. Screen sharing. Okay, is that okay or should I do file? My computer is really slow, so I hope I don't have any problems. Okay, that's understandable. You, okay. can see how slow it is. <laughs> okay, so, so I'm going to be talking to you about the intelligence of corvids. So the corvid family includes birds such as the crow, the raven, the rook, magpie, as well as jays. So pretty much any of the birds that you associate with death and bloom and misfortune and pestilence, those are the birds we're talking about. And in ancient times, they weren't really considered necessarily like bad. They were sort of more seen as like emissaries from the spirit world or beyond, but somehow that got conflated with fear and doom. I mean, we decided to name their flocks murders after all, so they've kind of gotten a bad rap. But as we start to kind of learn more about these, scientists and even just regular people have really started to realize that these are amazing birds with amazing intelligence. And they've been caught on camera doing some pretty interesting things. So here's a video. Ooh, I hope this works. Here's a clip of a bird or a crow playing fetch with a dog. I was so proud when I figured out how to embed videos in my PowerPoint and not, I, <laughs> not going to work. That's okay. I paused your time right now. Um, okay. Do you... Hold on, sometimes it works if it just, hold up. It might work better in here. Yeah, there you go. Maybe that will work. Right, let's see. There it goes. Oh, very well, it's good. It's a little small. A little small, but you can see what's happening. Mm -hmm. I'll start the time once it starts playing, okay? you didn't know that um, Corvidae are actually part of the bird song family huh? and here is a raven speaking um, you can actually teach them some words if they're in captivity long enough and here's a little clip of a raven saying hello or hi I think all sorts of voices uh, I'm not going to do this on my next presentation, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's okay. He does all sorts of voices. He said, hi. Hi. Good job. And sometimes he hears people who have a cold. <laughs> Good job. So it's not just words. They can mimic all kinds of different types of sounds. I think that's a hooded raven. But they also do some stuff that's kind of... Uh, 
questionable why they're even doing it. Here's a video someone caught of this raven instigating a fight between these two cats. <laughs> and who knows why it chose to do this, but you can see it harassing these two neighborhood cats. I'm just going to kind of skip around in it because it's long. You can see it just harassing these two cats and just getting them all riled up until eventually the two cats start fighting each other. And I think, I couldn't find the video for it, but there's even one where like these two crows are sitting on the roof and uh, there are two cats down in the alley and you can see like the crows make the sounds of cats to make it sound like the cats are howling at each other. And the cats like start looking at each other like that guy's trying to start a fight with me, but it's really the crows. <laughs> so you see this crow is just egging them on. And it's really pretty funny because who knows why it chose to do that other than its own entertainment. Really, um, really interesting behavior. But in nature, they're really famous for tool use, even on their own, unprovoked. You can see on the right there, a crow, they naturally are known to use sticks to fish out bugs and things like that. Um, more interestingly, on the left, in Japan, it was observed that the crows would drop nuts into the street, the crossing walk, and come back to retrieve them afterwards, because they would drop the nuts and the cars would break the shells open, wait for the light to turn red, and then they go and pick up the nuts that were really revealed. And they choose their streets carefully because they can't be too busy or it makes the nuts hard to retrieve, and they also can't be too, you know, they have to have enough cars to come by be able to get them. And when they're taught how to do something, as in an experiment or just for fun, we really can see what they can do. Um, in a theme park in France, over here, um, I forget the name of the, the person, but he taught crows how to, or rooks actually, he taught rooks how to pick up pieces of trash and throw them away in the bins to get rewards for treats. So they kept the park clean of cigarette butts and other little pieces of trash. And then um, the other, another experimenter called Hacker Josh Klein, he taught crows how to use a vending machine where he would, well, they would have to pick up coins and put them in the vending machine and then get the treats. So that guy got rich, I guess, from coins giving, or from ravens giving him loose change. Um, and you can even get a similar device to put in your own yard called the crow box, where you can train the crows in your own neighborhood to bring you money if you just really need to make some money and the crows to do it. But what really was an interesting discovery in terms of experimentation was they realized that crows are one of the only animals, possibly the only animal, at least that we know of, that has been recorded to use compound tools. So not just using a stick to retrieve something, as you can see, that's in the box, they have to use a stick to knock it down, they have to make the stick longer by combining these elements. You can see that they have to put the stick in one end of the little pocket, turn it around, put a stick in the other end. So it's really pretty complex. And it really, really gives us an insight as to how much these crows can do. But it doesn't always take such contrived situations to kind of get a sense for why they're so smart. It's been really well documented of crows bringing gifts to people that they like and that feed them. Um, you can go on the internet, find about 25 examples of people who have semi-tamed the crows in their neighborhood. Just by using classic conditioning, you know, you throw food out at a certain time of day and they start to associate you with the food at time of day and some sounds like you jingle your keys. And one woman in England, she um, did this for a period of years and these were all the different types of gifts that the crows would bring her just as tokens of appreciation, affection, who knows why. These are all the interesting things they brought her. And another interesting thing that tells us about just the scape of memory that these crows have there was an interesting experiment done in the University of Washington where these students would put on these masks and then go out and capture and tag the crows. And they would go back out wearing those same masks and see if the crows recognized them. Well, they did. They did more than that. The crows that recognized, hey, that person tagged me, they would then go over to their buddies in the tree, do a certain call, and all the crows would come and attack that guy. Even the ones who had had no experience with that specific person, they would get everybody, to, all their crow friends to gang up on that specific guy. 
And the interesting thing about that is that they held those grudges for about three years. So they specifically remembered those people. And I guess this is an illustration I'm guessing appeared in the uh, colleges and newspaper at the time. So the memory and cognition here is really quite self-evident. Um, on a cognitive level, crows are one of the only animals that understand object permanence and that just being something we develop when we're young. Whereas like just because something is out of sight doesn't mean it's vanished and gone forever. Um, Crows are one of the only ones that do that. Um, they also use imagination as we see, um, you know, as they mine the compound tools, it proves that they use imagination because being able to envision something that's not right in front of you, achieve a goal, that's what imagination is. And they can sort of combine all these, all these cognitive functions in their natural world because crows are known to hide food in storage. But they'll do more than that. They can actually remember how long that food's going to be good for based on the specific type. So like if they have a stash of berries over here, a stash of peanuts over there, they know it's been two weeks. They remember that those berries probably are not good by then, so they won't mess with those. They'll go back to the peanuts. And also in captivity, in experiments, they'll plan for breakfast, quote unquote. So if they know just based on routine that they get fed at night, they're not going to get fed in the morning. So they'll store some of that food for the morning, knowing that they're going to need it. Um, but even more amazingly about this, um, it kind of makes you question how deep the inner world of the crow is. Is this experiment done in terms of self-recognition, where the crows, as you can see over here, crows are put in front of a mirror, they put a sticker on the, crow ch on the crow's chest, and they'll actually, you know, see the reflection and go down and try to pick the sticker off of their chest. So this proves that they actually recognize themselves, and the only animals that we have recorded to do that are elephants and dolphins. That's pretty, pretty rare for the animal world. Um, one researcher named Dakota McCoy, she goes so far as to suggest that the crows actually really enjoy using tools and get a kick out of it and they even you know she studies their emotional states um so you know the way she looked at this was if they're put into a testing room and the crows see the box and they just like start inspecting it and they look excited and they're you know curious with gusto and that shows that they're interested to do the task but beyond that if they try to solve the problem multiple times and fail, they kind of lose motivation and they'll wander off. Maybe they're even discouraged. And that's something that really sounds like human behavior, if you ask me, but who knows, really. But I hope that, you know, next time you see a crow on your way home from work and it's a rainy night and he's up there on the telephone pole calling at you, you don't just immediately get creeped out <laughs> and you realize that you know, maybe they're just trying to creep you out so that you'll drop your lunch and they can all have a nice meal. So <laughs> thank you for listening. Thank you, Stephanie. That was fascinating. What, what, um, what drives your fascination of crows out of curiosity? I mean, I've always, every time I've heard a little anecdote about them over the years, I've just kind of stored it in my brain. And then I realized a few months ago that, see, I've heard about all these crazy experiments involving crows. I've even heard one where they can actually remember more words than a parrot if you teach them how to do it. And, but I couldn't find the proof on that. But I realized <laughs> I know all these amazing things about them. Maybe I should, you know, kind of, makes you think about animal intelligence in general, mm. I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Good job. All right, Caitlin. Okay. Can everyone see that? Is that oh, okay? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So, um, my name is Caitlin Hemperly, and um, we're going to be talking about internet crimes or um, cyber crimes. Um, I just found it was really interesting, so I wanted to look more into it. 
So what is a cybercrime? Uh, a cybercrime is defined as a crime where a computer is the object of a crime or is used as a tool to commit an offense. Um, a cybercriminal may use a device to access a user's personal information, um, confidential business information, government information, or just to simply disable a device. Um, and it's also a cybercrime to sell the above information online. So cybercrimes can actually be divided into two categories. Um, crimes that target uh, networks or devices, which would be like a virus, or crimes uh, using devices to participate in criminal activities, which would be like cyber stalking or identity theft. So the types of cyber crimes that there are, um, these are just a few examples. Um, a DDoS attack would be used to make an online service unavailable and take the network down by overwhelming the site with um, traffic from a variety of different sources. And then there's uh, botnets, which are networks from compromised computers that are controlled externally by a remote hacker. Identity theft, which would be when a criminal gains access to a user's personal information to steal funds, access confidential information, um, and they can do this by uh, hacking social media sites or gaining uh, uh, password access. Um, and then you have social, social engineering, which would be when a criminal would make direct contact with you um, who could pose as a customer service agent to gain your personal information. And then you have PUPS, which stands for Potentially Unwanted Programs, which could just be um, like a virus that would be downloaded. Um, and then you have phishing, which is an attack that involves hackers sending um, email attachments or URLs to gain access to an account or a computer, which normally um, actually are not flagged as spam emails. Um, and then you have prohibited or illegal content, which would be a criminal uh, sharing or distributing inappropriate content, including uh, material related to either um, acts of child exploitation or uh, material advocating for terrorism. And then you have online spam or online scams, which would be uh, like an ad or spam email advertising rewards, such as money or, you know, you want a trip for two to Hawaii. Um, and then you have the exploit kits, which would just be um, a bug in the code of a software. So um, there are many different types of internet crimes, but the first cases that were evident was a series of hackings in the 1970s. Um, so that would take us to the history of internet crimes. So in the 70s, which is when early computerized phone systems started to become a target for hackers, and there was actually a group of individuals called the Freakers who discovered um, correct codes and tones that would result in um, them gaining access to long distance services. So essentially they would hack this company and they um, started to gain free long distance telephone minutes is what they were trying to do. And this was actually very difficult for the authorities to navigate since technology was so new um, and there were really no investigators that had the skill to navigate the technology to be able to find evidence of these hackers. So while all of that was happening in the 70s, it actually wasn't until 1986 that a tactic was created to determine who a hacker was. And it was created by a man named Clifford Stoll, which is this man right here. Um, and he was actually a systems administrator. Um, and he noticed that there were some irregulations in um, some of his accounting data. Um, and then he ultimately decided that he was being hacked and created something called a honey hole, um, which would actually lure a hacker back into the network so that he could gather enough data um, to actually track the source of the hacking. And although it started as just a means to get free long distance phone, or cell phone minutes, um, internet crimes actually started branching out into many different scenarios that can affect all of individuals of age, um, gender, or actually where they live. So that would bring us to um, anyone can be a victim of any kind of internet crime, um, such as men, women, children, adults, and even celebrities who are supposed to have the um, advanced uh, security systems. So this is actually a graph from 2017 from a website called Private Tunnel, and it shows state by state um, what gender and age group is actually most common to be a victim of uh, cybercrime. And that's not saying that there are not cases that are outside of that age range or of the opposite gender that are not becoming victims in those states, because there are. Um, but for example, I live in Texas, 
and the number of cyber crimes um, males victims that th there are, um, Texas actually ranks 13th out of all the states in number of male victims, and in, in female victims, they rank 22nd out of all the states. Um, and to actually compare the top 10 states with the most um, cyber crime victims of all ages and genders are actually the red states on this map. And number one is California, two would be Florida, three is Nevada, four is Texas, five is New Mexico, six is New York, um, Arizona and Virginia are tied at seven, and then Colorado is nine and Washington is 10. And since Piedmont's in Georgia, Georgia actually falls in at number 11 for the most um, cybercrime victims. So now that it's you know pretty clear with this map that all people of different ages and genders and areas can be victims, um, people of higher social statuses, including celebrities, can also be victims, including Mark Zuckerberg, who's actually the CEO of Facebook. Um, this is a screenshot from an article from uh, bbc.com. Uh, the caption under his photo is, um, he might run the world's largest, biggest social networking site, but not even Mark Zuckerberg is immune to being hacked. Um, and according to Open Data Security, Mark Zuckerberg was hacked in 2000, 2012 by a group called Our Mind because he had the same password for all of his social networks. And the hackers actually were able to get access to over 117 million different individuals' passwords. Um, so because cyber crimes have the potential to affect anyone and everyone, people should understand how to protect themselves and their property from potential intrusions. Um, so this is, uh, according to the FBI, these are some key steps to protecting your computer or any technology from a intrusion. Um, so one would just to be to keep your firewall on, install or update any virus or any antivirus updates, install or update your anti-spyware software, keep your operating system updated, be careful what you download, and to turn off your computer. And honestly, just as well as some common sense things like not posting anything uh, that can be taken out of context or something that can be manipulated, um, don't post your personal information on the internet, and to be careful who you're communicating with. So even with taking these precautions, individuals need to understand that technology is constantly changing and people should educate themselves on how to continue uh, to fight against cyber crimes um, on all platforms. So if you're interested, these are some cyber, uh, these are some cyber security organizations working to improve cyber security, including the SANS Institute, the Center for Internet Security, and Women in Cybersecurity, as well as so many others. Um, these are just some of the ones that are actually in the United States. Um, and so here's my work cited. So if there are any questions. Any questions? Caitlin, that was a, a great speech. Um, do you think, uh, or in, from what you've seen, has there been an increase in cybercrime as so much more you know, work and school and, and transactions are being done online in the last few months? Yeah, so um, I actually read, whenever I was trying to do some research, um, I actually read that this year has been the most um, reported cybercrime uh, cases because of coronavirus, so everyone's doing everything online, you know, trying to order their groceries online, trying to get, um, you know, toilet paper from, you know, things that aren't really secure networks that people are putting their personal information to try to get, you know, things because everyone's quarantined. So they're actually in the past few months um, are more cyber um, crimes than sure. there been in the past years. Great. Thank you so much. Good speech. Thank you. All right. We have Danielle um, and then Christian, and then we'll take a little break. Um, where was the button at where you said we could share our computer audio? Um, so when you click, let's undo this, undo your share screen. Um, oh, wait. Yeah, or maybe here, I could actually, actually, there you go. So now when you click share screen, um, it should be on the lower left-hand side. It, uh, when you click on share screen, share computer oh. sound, see it? Yes, I do. Thank you. Sure thing.
Um, to share your computer audio, please install the Zoom audio device. Okay. <laughs> Is that something you, you could do quickly, it looks like? Um, yeah, let me type in my uh, phone. So, yeah. All right, I'm assuming it downloaded. It pro from my experience, when I did that, it was really quick, so. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so hi, my name is Danielle, and I did my presentation on Haha ha Tonka State Park, which is located in Camden, Missouri. It actually happens to be my family's hometown, so this is one of my favorite places, probably on earth. Um, Haha ha Tonka State Park is free to the public. It has a total of 14 trails, which cover 15 miles of trek. Um, it is a 3,751 acre park, so it is huge. Annually, they have about 520,000 visitors. Um, there are a lot of amenities too, like restrooms, picnic areas, trash cans, um, convenient parking options at all of the main hotspots of the park, as well as handicap accessible portions. Um, they did wanna make sure that it was friendly to everyone who wanted to visit, which is one of my favorite things about this park. Um, ha Ha Tonka is known for where nature and history come together. There's just about everything that you could imagine in this one state park. I included this picture here that has labeled some of my favorite places, including sinkholes, caves, natural bridges, sheer bluffs, a natural spring, lake access, historical ruins, and an 1872 post office. Um, I will talk further about all of these things throughout the presentation. So way in the beginning of Ha Ha Tonka, it was first discovered by early Native Americans and explorers. Um, they were drawn to this place by its remarkable beauty and the abundance of resources that it could be used. In the early 19th century, um, Daniel Boone and his son Nathan actually used this area for fur trapping. Um, Zebulion Pike, who's most known for Pike's Peak out in Colorado, also crossed through this area on his way out west. In 1903, Robert M. Snyder, he was a businessman, came across Ha Ha Tank, Tonga State Park and actually purchased 5,000 acres of the land. Um, he is a significant person in the production of this park, and I will talk about that more later on. In 1909, Missouri's Governor Herbert S. Hadley actually pushed to have this um, become Missouri's first national state park. But unfortunately, that did not happen until 1978 when Missouri uh, decided that Haha ha Tonka should be made a state park. So now Robert M. Snyder, like I mentioned, was a wealthy Kansas City businessman. Um, he made his money through the railroad. That's actually how he crossed paths with Haha ha Tonka. Um, they were looking to expand railroads through this area. Unfortunately, with the bluffs, as mentioned, um, it was not possible to have the railroads come through here, but he was also drawn to its beauty. Um, he envisioned building a private retreat, um, which led him to purchase the 5,000 acres. In 1905, he began construction on his um, retreat that he had envisioned. He wanted to build a European style castle and that's actually what's pictured here to the right. The castle is at the top of the picture and his carriage house is what is in the middle towards the bottom. He wanted the center atrium to be a rise or to rise three and a half stories and have a skylight. The castle would also contain 60 rooms and there was to be a 80 foot high water tower, greenhouses and the carriage house. Um, Materials were actually extracted from the area, which was interesting to me because the sandstone was quarried nearby and transported by a mule drawn wagon all the way up to the top. And you have to think this is a huge castle or house per se. Um, and for all of that stone to be carried to the top by a mule and wagon must have taken forever. But unfortunately, Mr. Snyder did not get to see the completion of the house because he died in 1906. Um, coincidentally enough, in one of the state's first automobile accidents. However, the four sons that are pictured with him did finish the, his father's dream. Um, it was not as extravagant as his father had hoped for, but the sons did complete it and lease it as a hotel, which later turned into a bed and breakfast. In 1920, the construction of the Bagnell Dam led to most of the property that Mr. Snyder had purchased um, ending up underwater. It is actually what formed Lake of the Ozarks. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's been on the news recently with the coronavirus as a tourist hotspot. Um, 
And then unfortunately in 1942, a fire caused by chimney sparks burned the castle to the ground. Um, it also caught fire to the carriage house in that same day. And the castle and the carriage house burned for three or four days and nights until it was finally left with nothing but stone. And then in 1976, the water tower was burned by vandals. Um, this here is a picture of the ruins today of the carriage house on the left and the water tower on the right. My first question was how the water tower worked. Um, there's a spring at the bottom of the bluff, which actually had a hydraulic ram pump, which lifted the water to the water tower. Um, this was a distance of 300 feet, a vertical distance of 300 feet. And then gravity did the rest of the work carrying it up to the house. This here is a picture of the castle ruins today. Um, this is one of my favorite places to go. We've taken family pictures here, and this is really the main tourist attraction at Haha ha Tonka State Park. Um, it has a lot of beautiful things, which I will talk about later on, but most people are drawn to the castle. And then just here, I wanted to show a video of the castle ruins and just some aerial shots so you can understand truly how big this place is. As you can see in the video, um, the ruins are ginormous. You are allowed to go up to the ruins of both the water tower, the carriage house, and the castle. However, they do have some places marked off around and in the castle just because over time they have had problems with falling rocks um, and construction to keep up with the castle. But you are allowed to go up and around in it, which is really cool. Oh, don't want to play the video again. Um, another man-made attraction would be the Haha ha Tonka Post Office. It was constructed in 1872. Um, it functioned as both a general store and a post office, so it was multi-purpose. Um, it was fully operational until 1937. It's currently not open to the public, um, the main reason being just how close it sits to the road. And this picture doesn't do it justice, but this is sitting right in the middle of a curve. So. Oftentimes people write their cars into the side of this building because like you can see it is right up against the road and being in a curb doesn't help much either. But this is just another piece of history that is left in Ha Ha Tonka State Park. Um, you might have also noticed in the video the color of the spring and the water that was below the bluff. Um, the in Ha Ha Tonka State Park is Missouri's 12th largest spring. Um, it flows from underground caves, which you can see on the left is where the cave opening is and the water comes out that way. Uh, the hiking trail also follows right along the spring, which is really cool. You can start from where it enters the lake and walk all the way up to where the cave um, begins. The water runs out at 45 or 54 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit year round since it is coming from underground. The temperature outside and the seasons don't affect it whatsoever. 
it also discharges 48 million gallons of water a day. And just to put that into perspective, the average person drinks or takes in 16,000 gallons of water in their lifetime. So that means this spring would produce 3,000 lifetimes of water every single day. The beautiful blue color that you also see um, comes from a variety of dissolved minerals that are in the water and it is unique to the area which is really cool um, and the picture on the right here you can kind of see the haze over the spring but that's where it flows into the lake and they have it marked off but you can go up and sit right where the spring flows into the lake and in that area there because um, like I said swimming is prohibited in the spring. Another um, natural attraction would be the geologic features in this area uh, Haha Tonka State Park is a premier showcase of carp topography, um, which means that it is a three-dimensional landscape shaped by the dissolution of soluble layers of bedrock. And then these landscapes are the result of processes of occurring thousands of years and contain distinctive surfaces and surfaceable features. So over here to the left um, is known as Devil's Kitchen. It got that name just based off of its size, but as you can see where the man's walking down is referred to as the counter, la height, and then up above would be the cabinets. Um, and it kind of loops around in a circle because it was created by a sinkhole. So that's how it got the name Devil's Kitchen because they say the kitchen is sinking down to hell. Um, the center here is a balancing rock, which again was formed in a similar way, but the way that the soil and the sediment in the rock um, eroded around it left a balancing rock. And then on the right here is a natural bridge. Um, these natural bridges are formed due to water running through the limestone caves. Um, and these caves eventually form sinkholes and on each side was a sinkhole. And when the sinkholes fall down, it leaves what's known as a natural bridge standing in between. Ha Ha Tonka actually has three natural bridges. This one pictured on the right being the largest and you can see the people standing up underneath it. This one here is actually standing a hundred feet high from the floor of the sinkhole. And then that brings me to caverns and sinkholes. Um, these caverns and sinkholes are much like the ones that would have created the natural bridge that was on the previous slide. Um, and then on the right here, you can see how the stairs and the trails are made throughout the um, elevations of Ha Ha Tonka State Park. So then you can see everything just as well. It is prohibited to go into the caves and caverns and most of them are barred off. Um, but that doesn't always stop people, unfortunately, and there is vandalism. But this you can see here how the walkway goes right down to the cave. And if you look close enough, you can see the bars here um, blocking off the cavern. And I wanted to end this presentation with two quotes that I found. The first one is from USA Today stating that Ha Ha Tonka State Park is the number four best state park in the country. So it is nationally recognized. And then Travel Magazine said it is the most beautiful place in Missouri. So at this point, I would like to open it up for any questions. I just have a comment. Can you send me your, your PowerPoint so I can show it to my husband because we like to visit state parks and I want to go. Yeah, sure, I can do that. <laughs> Take my motorcycle and go. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, I can do that. But it's a beautiful place, it really is. And my PowerPoint doesn't even do it justice, honestly. How did you first uh, like find out about this place, your family? Um, so my family is actually from Camden County. This park is 10 minutes down the road from my grandparents' house. So okay. it's where we go all the time. I mean, one of our favorite places. That would be awesome to be able to go there all the time. I know. <laughs> Have you ever been to any of the caves? Um, I haven't, but like I said, it didn't become a state park until the late seventies. So my parents remember being younger and they used to go down into the caves and like take their dirt bikes and swim in the springs. They have a whole bunch of stories from before it was a state park. And even after they made it a state park, um, people didn't always follow the rules, but now they're pretty straight. DNR stays there almost all the time and they'll patrol, but yeah, they've got some stories. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. Thanks so much, Danielle. Never heard of it, but now I want to go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. All right. We have Christian up next. Is he? Yep. <clears throat> um, right. Let me share screen.
All right, so uh, backstory on my, myself, uh, I spent four years in foster care and in the DFAC system as a child from age three to age seven. Um, but I, my speech is on the emancipation of minors in the foster care, foster care systems in America. All right, so the issue behind this is there are, are currently 400,000 children in foster care systems in the United States. Um, this is, and this is due to uh, child neglect, child abuse, uh, the state coming in to, the state stepping in rather, to see, to take the child from the home that they know, identify as a, a harmful environment to the child. Uh, so out of 400,000 children that are currently in the foster care and child protective service systems of the United States, 27,000 of these children emancipate themselves each year. And, and the majority of them are teenagers uh, that emancipate themselves. The, the average age for these kids is roughly 15 to 18 years old. And the states are allowing this to happen because for them, every child, same thing as a prisoner, it costs the state tax dollars to take care of a child. Uh, whether that's in a group home or a foster parent home. And for them, the, when a child elects to emancipate themselves, it, they see it as them saving money and being able to remove a child from the foster care systems in America. So what happens when these children emancipate themselves? And we've seen it before. Uh, in our own communities, the amount of homelessness and poverty in our own community. But what happens with these children is many of these kids don't continue their education after they emancipate themselves. They just go about their way and they get lost outside of the system that they were once in. And 40 to 50 percent of them become homeless within the first year and a half. 65% um, of these emancipated children uh, require housing immediately. And what will happen is, is they'll try to seek out homeless shelters. Uh, some of them will try to join the military because for them, the military means they have a place to stay and they have income. So what happens with their education is like most people, like children who they don't have any adult or government supervision, they run free. They do what they choose to, they elect to do what they want rather than to continue their own education. And with that, 40% of these emancipated minors complete high school uh, compared to the 83% of children who are remaining in state care in these foster and group homes who do graduate high school. Now, 70% of the emancipated minors who remain in school say they want to go to college, but only 10% of them will actually attend it and, and less than 1% will ever actually graduate from college. Now, with anything, we need employment, we need jobs, we need a source of income and revenue in our lives. So what happens when a child elects to emancipate themselves they have to find a job, but with no viable, with no viable skills or no, education, I I finished mine and I was like, okay, I'm gonna have they're unable to do that, and 50% of them will experience unemployment within three to five years of emancipation, and now 60% of the emancipated minors earn $6,000 or less than that per year. And more often than not, that's due to panhandling or picking up work as a day laborer that you'll see outside of a home improvement store. And that's lower than the national poverty rate that the federal government uh, released at $7,890 per single individual. Now, what will also happen to these children is, like many children from age 12 to 15 that I'm sure we all, 
all remember growing up in middle school and early on in high school, we want to find a friend group. We want to find a place in a group that we belong to. And for them, when they don't have a family or a group that they can call their own that's going to guide them in the right direction, they often join gangs. And gangs will recruit in these low-income areas where many of these children end up. And they become coerced, they become brainwashed, and they join these gangs and start committing crimes. And with that leads to incarceration. Now, foster children are 33% more likely to join a gang after they emancipate themselves. And 27% of prisoners in the United States have been in foster care at one point in their lives. And the data shows that the children that, who emancipate themselves are five to 10 times more likely to become incarcerated due to that wanting to feel belonging to something. They want to feel part of a group and something. They want to feel family that cares for them. And 25% of them will be incarcerated within the first two years. 76% of prisoners who are released are likely to return to prison within the first five years after they're paroled. Now, this begs the question, how do we fix this? How do we solve this problem? And the answer to it, and several politicians have currently released legislation and introduced legisl legislation both to the Congress and in the House to restrict the age of emancipation for minors in foster care. They want to limit the amount, they want to raise the age that these people, these children are allowed to emancipate themselves because they apply to it from the state. And the state grants it because for them, it's a tax write-off. They don't have to spend these tax dollars on these children for their medical care, for their education, for anything. And what we also need to do is create new and also improve the current programs designed to ensure these children's academic success, whether it's tutoring or just counseling services because many of these children suffer from TTSD. They've been abused, they've been neglected, and they want to feel belong to something. They want to have someone be able to understand what these children have gone through. And with that, we have to offer and improve those counseling services to these children because these wounds don't heal in a specific time frame. For some of these children, it can heal over time. Myself, it took me the better part of 20 years to heal from the abuse that I suffered in foster care and in the army and beyond. But what we need to do with these children is be able to extend the counseling services and improve these counseling services to these children. And then furthermore, extend those counseling services once they reach college, because we all know that college is a very stressful time, especially for young adults. We know that these children who have never had a real family environment, they've never had any real encouragement or a single mentor to help them along the way, to explain to them right from wrong, to explain to them what it means to be a productive member of society. They've only known a, two people, foster parents, who were there to basically keep watch on them to make sure, to ensure they didn't die in their care, or they've known a group environment where they often get just slipped through the cracks. So we need to extend those services to these children after they go to college. Otherwise, they're, I mean, they're, their future is sealed, and they will resort to that gang life. They will resort to crime. They will end up unemployed and either resort to gang violence, intimidation, or pure thievery just to make their everyday means and to make their lives get by. And with that, we need to improve that. We need to improve our education system. We need to help these school counselors, these school teachers understand the child's individual situation, what they're going through, what they've been through. Because more often than not, this gets overlooked. And these, ch these children are labeled as slackers, lazy, they don't care, they just want to leave. 
and it's it's the wrong answer to a growing problem because out of 400,000 children who are in foster care you have 26,000 of them who emancipate themselves every year because they see it as a means to an end and there are problems within the defects and CPS systems that need to be addressed the the abuse and the neglection they need to be addressed and handled appropriately but before we can do that, we need to restrict the age of emancipation because once these minors emancipate themselves, they're no longer in the care of the state. They need guidance, they need supervision because if it's not the state or a foster parent or even an adoptive parent then that's gonna do it, who will? These are my sources with all these statistics and data to back this up. And I will take questions. Thank you for sharing your story and your service. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Such an important topic. Are there some countries that, in your research that do this better? Um, there are uh, countries in Scandinavia. Um, I didn't include it in my presentation, but what happens to a lot of these children is when they're out on the on the streets and once they become homeless, and like we've seen with our own poverty issues in America, a lot of homeless people resort to drugs as a way to suppress their own hunger. And what happens with countries in Scandinavia, other countries and parts of Europe is they take these people in, they have better facilities for their homeless citizens that offer counseling, they offer technical work details, they offer them sources and, and materials that can actually help them find jobs. And in part of that, they also help those, these citizens find jobs. And granted, yeah, they're not high paying jobs, but it's work nonetheless. And it's an improvement of their own situation at present. And gives them an environment that they can, or, you know, Does. relate to, have connections with and whatnot. Yeah, thank you so much. Christian, very important speech, um, good topic, uh, great job. All right, let's take, let's see, it is 7.17 now, let's come back at seven, uh, let's come back at 7.25, so about eight minutes, and then we'll, and then Tori will start us back up.
All right, Tori, you ready? Yes, yes. All right. Take okay. your take your time. All right. So hit the share button. And share. Let's see. All right. All right. Hello. Well, my name is Tor Christensen, and I want to talk to you about macro and micro managers. When you look at this picture, what do you believe these individuals play in an organization? To me, they look like your typical manager. However, managers come in all sorts, all forms, and cover a variety of uh, businesses or, or spectrums. Like we could take the teacher, for example. She manages students. We can take the McDonald's manager. He manages his employees. Or we could talk about the greatest football coach ever, Brandon Bean. They all manage people. So what is a manager? A manager is an individual who is in charge of certain groups of tasks or certain subset of an organization. Now let's look at some qualities and responsibilities of managers. Um, some responsibilities and qualities of a highly effective manager, they're very efficient. They take their time in planning and paperwork. They follow the procedures and regulations, and they control and consistency. Now that we know the technical terms of managers, let's get into specific and look at two distinct types of managers. We have a micromanager who is the boss who takes a handoff approach and lets his employees do their things with minimal direction. We also have a micromanager who closely observes and controls his employees. Now, the micromanager, they get a bad rap. They are considered control freaks. How many times have we heard a, someone complain about being micromanaged? We all have. Now, a macro manager, they're the this is what most managers are. They take their time, they give directions and hand off. Now, I wanna take a few minutes and tell you a story. And at the end of the story, I want us to think about what a micro and macro managers are. So here, we have a waste management company. So the CEO walks in, tells his employees or tells his three managers, hey, look, I need this pile of trash moved. So then he leaves the room. So the first manager takes out his book, takes out a checklist and goes by the book, tells all his employees, I need this done, I need this done, I need this done. He's making sure he's point blank, I gotta do it by the book. So then we get to the second manager. He grabs his group of guys, takes them out, rolls up his sleeves, gets in there, tells his guys, hey, look, I want you guys to go do this. I want you guys to do this. I want you to move these boxes here, these boxes here, and I'm gonna sit right here and I'm gonna do this right here. But he's closely watching each group of what he told them to do. Third guy, he walks in, he's like, look guys, grabs his group of guys, says, hey, look, I want you guys to go grab a pile, some dynamite, blow up the trash and sweep it up. Well. Throughout all of this, were you able to pick out who was the micro and the macro manager? Well, here's the breakdown. The CEO, he's your typical macro manager. He tells his managers what he wants done, leaves the room, lets them get it done. Then we have the first manager, the checklist by the book. He's your typical micro manager. He instructs and he wants to make sure everything gets done by the book. Then we have the third manager, the guy who tells his guys, go out there and take some dynamite, blow it up and sweep it up. Well, he's your micro, he's your macro manager. He's a guy who gives direction, lets the guys get it done. Then we have our second manager, 
he's the roll up your sleeve, get in there and let's get this done. And I'm going to do this, but he's watching. He's kind of tricky. If you really honestly think about it, he seems like a macro manager, but he's really a micromanager because even though he's directing people to do things, he's closely watching and giving direction to each subset of his employees. Now this manager, the second guy, he's typically non-threatening a lot of people get a little bit confused because he's non-threatening this is the best type of manager that people feel even though they're being micromanaged but they don't know it <clears throat> so now that we know the difference between micro and macro managers which one is best which one fits into the company which which one's the best type well the answer is simple there really is not a better type of manager. The company needs both of them. No one is better than the other. They all work. All organizations and all companies need both types of managers in their organization and they fit in perfectly. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Tori. Um, which, in your experience, which how come the micromanager always gets uh, kind of a bad rap? The micromanager gets a bad rap because microman people like direction, but they don't want someone watching over them a lot. I have, me and myself, I have a problem where I, when I first started in, um, as a manager in a corporation, I was a micromanager and I micromanaged my employees and it's kind of hard because people, like I said, people don't like to be someone standing over them. And then I learned the macro side of things. So I kind of go in between both every once in a while because I'm kind of an A-type personality and I do like things done a lot. And I want to make sure it's done. So I kind of do borderline micro macro. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Any other questions? Thanks, Tori. I find myself as chair of the mass comm department. Um, being a micromanager when there's something I'm passionate about, but I end up usually just doing it myself. And so I don't have to put anyone else through the pain of me correcting them all the time. <laughs> all right, Connie, you're up next. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Shit here. Okay, so um, my speech is called, Why Does This Guy Look Weird? Um, as an allergy and asthma sufferer, um, I'm very concerned with, is my camera working? Yes. Okay, and my light's not on for some reason. <laughs> okay, um, as an as allergy and asthma sufferer, I worry about air quality. And I've noticed, and you may have noticed, that if you go outside right now, there's a lot of haze in the sky. So I have a photo here that was taken on Saturday at Lake Lanier. And if you notice in the background of this photo, that there's a lot of haze over the, the lake above the trees. And it's normally you can see that tree line much better in the background. This is caused by Sahara dust in the desert or from the desert. Every year, because this is not a new event, it happens every year on a regular basis, um, dust from the Sahara Desert in Africa is carried across the ocean to the Americas. Um, 182 million tons a year is the average. Um, and, it's, and it covers, it, the Sahara covers an area of Africa that's as large as the 48 United States together. So it's a very large area and it brings a lot of, sends a lot of dust across the ocean by desert winds and um, that carry the sand and dust into the atmosphere. Then the trade winds that travel across the oceans pick them up and bring them across to the Atlantic and the Caribbean. This year we have the most dust expected in over 50 years. So in the last 50 to 60 years there has not been as big of a sandstorm or dust storm as there is going on right now. And that's one reason why the sky looks so much hazier than we're used to seeing in the summertime. 
this NASA photo shows dust being carried off the coast of Africa. This was actually from 2003, but you can see the brown from the dust as it enters the atmosphere and goes into the trade winds as it's carried across. And there's a reason why this happens every year besides just the wind blowing. It's a way for the earth to replenish itself. So there are benefits to it. Um, the earth in over in the Amazon basin in South America, they, they have a lot of flooding in the rainforest and nutrients get carried away. So the dust cloud offers the benefit of bringing iron and phosphorus from the desert across to the Amazon basin so that those things are replenished in the soil and they're vital for plant growth. And of course, you know, the rainforest provides a lot of oxygen for our atmosphere. So that's a very important process to keep those trees growing. Um, also, and you may have noticed this year, there haven't been as many hurricanes. The moisture that is needed to form hurricanes over the ocean is soaked up by these, these dust and sand in the atmosphere. And it helps to prevent the intensity and duration of hurricanes. So this year, there have only been four named hurricanes and the hurricane season started in April and here we are at the end of June. Um, and that may last for several more weeks. And of course, as the dust cloud starts to dissipate, then there will be a possibility of more named hurricanes forming later on in the summer. But for right now, there aren't any major hurricanes or tropical storms in the Atlantic. Also, it, it creates beautiful sunsets. Um, the sunlight bounces off of the dust particles and it makes the beautiful sky at night. So if you go outside, even I imagine right now, or in the next little bit, you'll be able to see um, a lot of color in the sky. And that's because of the, the light bouncing off of those dust particles. And it's been that way for the last couple of weeks as the dust started to approach. But there are harmful effects of the dust. That same phosphorus and iron falls into the ocean as it travels across um, from, from the west, to the west, from the east. And it can fall into the ocean and cause an overabundance of red algae because they feed on those same nutrients that the soil feeds on. And that can lower oxygen levels in the ocean and contribute to uh, not enough food being there and not enough oxygen for the fish. So that does make a difference. And you may hear about red algae later on as we go through the year. Um, the one that I was concerned about was air quality concerns. Uh, large, particle, large particulates can make breathing outdoors more difficult and dangerous. If you're a person who goes outside a lot, if you hike or you do activities outside, you may want to wear a mask. Um, I checked the air quality on Saturday and it was 52 for large particles and 152 for small particles, which was unhealthy for sensitive groups. And you can check that anytime on airnow.gov. Um, also, there's the possibility that the material, there may be other foreign materials in the dust, like bacteria from things like camel dung that have dried in the desert heat and they also get picked up in that wind and carried over. Um, right now, I haven't heard of any, anybody having any illnesses from that, but it is always a possibility that has to be considered. Um, let's see. So if you go outside, um, be aware that you may want to wear a mask if you have asthma or breathing difficulties. Um, but other than that, skip, enjoy the sunsets. And in the future, when you hear about Saharan dust storms, you'll maybe know a little bit more about what that means and how that affects or can affect the earth and why we have it and that we do have it every year. It's not novel. It's not a new thing, but it is significant this year. And this is a picture from my backyard, actually, um, from last night. I took this picture to put on my spreadsheet. Well, actually, this one is from June 14th. I didn't get the one from last night. This one is from June 14th as the dust was just starting to spread across and you can see some of the colors in the clouds and they are much more bright. They're much brighter and more significant now. So I thought I'd share that. Very cool. And some of my references there. Thank you, Connie. Is this um, more prevalent like in certain parts of the country, like being in the yes, South? Right now, um, it, right now it's covering the South. And normally we don't get um, a lot of, I'm trying to stop sharing. 
a lot normally we don't get a lot of the dust it it mostly settles over the Caribbean and the northern northern part of South America but this year because there's so much and it's spread farther north they're getting it as far as the Midwest so it's covered the south and north North Carolina out to Texas and up towards the Midwest they're getting a lot of dust this year and normally there's some areas that don't see it like in Texas especially they don't see a lot of it and uh -huh. they're seeing it this year sometimes for the first time because there's so much of it. Very cool thank you yeah I've noticed I was out Side a couple days, I got a hammock for Father's Day, um, and so I put it together. Was outside chilling the last couple of days, reading my slash autobiography, and then noticed that, like my allergies and asthma started acting up, and like, oh, that's why. So, great job, thank you, Connie. All right, up next we have Jeremy. Can you guys hear me? We can. All right, perfect. Okay, I'm gonna get my stuff pulled up here. One. Sure second. thing. Take your time. All right. So I'm kind of taking a different approach here. Um, how many of you guys have like computer speed issues? Like, give me a thumbs up in the chat, or, or like a thumbs up if you guys are having like speed issues or something like that. Yeah, there's a few of you for sure. So what I did, um, I kind of, I made a PowerPoint and I'm gonna give you guys some information on uh, why a computer's slow and, and what you can do to prevent that. Uh, so that way, uh, you know, it'll help you guys out a little bit. And uh, yeah, if you're interested, you know, grab a notepad and maybe take some notes and uh, you, might, you guys might be able to help your computers out a little bit. So let me go ahead and pull this. All right, and this is how to speed up your slow computer. Um, all right, so first things first, um, what we're going to start with is like what actually causes these, uh, uh, you know, computers to be slow and like uh, the part that, ca that causes that or that, that it's hosted on. Uh, so this part is called a hard drive. Basically, um, all of your data is stored on these platters um, and you know, it's it's basically stored magnetically. Uh, there's magnetic particles when they're aligned a certain way. Uh, there's a small reader here that basically reads that and it can tell where your data is. Uh, this is an inherently slow process, uh, mainly because these platters have to spin and it has to find where the data is. Uh, so, you know, this takes your computer some time to do. Um, and as, as a result of that, your computer's slower whenever you're opening a program or trying to run a program. Um, you know, not necessarily processing, but finding the actual data. Um, so yeah, this is, you know, the picture I have here is just the inside of a hard drive. It doesn't actually look like that in, you know, inside of the computer, it's got a cover on it. But whenever you open it up, this is, you know, this is pretty much what it looks like here. Okay. Um, and, you know, that's obviously the, the mechanical aspect of the drive. That's not the only reason that, that computers are slow. You can also have uh, viruses. Basically, viruses are just unwanted programs that um, you download online accidentally most of the time. Um, so whenever these get on there, they, they run as processes in the background and it slows your computer down even more. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna talk about how to get rid of those, what you guys need to do to get rid of those. Um, another thing is programs that, that are starting, that you, that you do want, that are starting in the background and you don't even really know about it. Um, so there, you know, there's a way to go in there and, and take those out. So I'll definitely be showing you guys how to do that a little bit. Um, and I'll even have some interactive portions in a minute here, you know, kind of showing you guys how to do this. Um, too much data on a hard drive. Basically, whenever you get a hard drive and it starts filling up, it has more data that it has to sort through. Um, you know, this causes the, you know, the print, you know, the stuff I was showing you earlier, this needle, it has to look around for that data. So um, the more data you have, the slower your hard drive is gonna be. Um, and you know, there's a way to get around that, and I'm gonna talk about that uh, you know, in a little bit. Um, and then obviously you've got data being in the wrong spot on the drive. Sometimes if you have data, it can fragment across, and you'll have some data on one portion of the drive, and then the rest of it on another portion. And you need to go in there and, and sort it to where it's all together, and it'll make your computer a little faster, okay? Uh, you know, this slowness, uh, it can be mitigated. There's a way to do that. So I'm going to kind of go over some stuff and uh, we'll have uh, 
some interactive stuff here in a little bit. So the first thing you want to do is you want to run antivirus software. And a lot of the times if your computer is just running really slow for no reason, um, so viruses are, are, you know, a lot of the computers I fix, it's about 50% of the time and there's a virus on them. Uh, so this is a great way to just quickly get your computer sped up. Um, I use Hitman Pro. I've got a link over there in the bottom right corner if you guys are interested. Um, and there's a free chart trial with that. So that'll go in, that'll get rid of all of the, the viruses. It's one of the best ones I've found. So it's really great. Um, another good program you can use is CCleaner. Basically what that's gonna do is, you know how I was talking about um, computers just having too much data. CCleaner is gonna get rid of like all your temp files, uh, anything that's just taking up space and not really doing anything for you. Uh, so CCleaner is a great way to do that. Um, and then obviously you, your computer systems as well, there's a way you can go in and actually go into your startup folder and stop programs that you don't even want to run in the background. And I'm actually going to show you guys how to do that here. Um, let's see. Okay. So the first thing you want to do, we want to open your task manager and that's going to let, Basically, your task manager is just a list of all the programs running on your computer um, whenever they need to start, like all that stuff. So to open that, you're just going to right click this little Windows button here. And this is for Windows 10 PC. So if you guys have another operating system, uh, some of this stuff will apply, but this is mainly for Windows 10. Uh, so just right click this, go to your task manager here. Um, you can see all the processes you have running on your computer. Uh, generally, you don't want any of these to be pegging out of, at 100%. If there are, just follow the steps here and, and those numbers will go down as you work. Um, you can go into startup here though, and if there's like any programs you've seen here that you don't really use, you can go in here and disable them. Like you can see I've got a bunch of these disabled that I just, I, I need them for work, but I don't use them that often. I'll just go open them manually if I want to use those. Uh, so this is a great way. This is one of the main ways uh, to get your computer, especially like whenever you're first starting it up, this is a great way to just get rid of that like initial boot time. Uh, so task manager is great for that. Okay, let me get this open back up. All right, um, but yeah, that's kind of how you go in there and and uh, sort through your programs, get all that stuff set out. Uh, there's also, uh, to go along with the programs, you can go to your actual programs on your computer just go to add and remove programs. And there's all kinds of stuff on here. And if there's something that you guys don't recognize or you guys don't really use, um, as long as it's not part of the actual system, like you can just go in there and uninstall it. Uh, and that'll get rid of the data on your drive. Or if there's something you don't ever use, you can just get rid of it. Okay, let's see. And we'll continue here. Uh, another thing you can do, I mentioned earlier that your data on your actual hard drive basically it's gonna get separated sometimes. It's gonna fragment is what they call it, and it's on a physical different portion on the disk. Um, and basically that causes the, uh, the heads on the hard drive to have to search for that data instead of it just being all together in one spot, and it makes it way slower. Uh, so a way you can do that is just pull up defrag on your computer here. It's just defrag and optimize drives. Like my solid state drive, it needs to be optimized right now I don't have a hard drive in this computer but we'll get onto that later uh, so basically what you do is you just go optimize and it'll optimize it and put all your data in one spot so it, it can be found more quickly okay. um, you know if you do all of these steps and you're still having issues of just the computer being slow more than likely your hard drive is either just really old uh, or physically damaged so what you can do is you can get the, uh, something called a solid state drive. It's what I've got on my, in my laptop right now. Uh, basically, instead of being on like a physical spinning disk that it has to go in there uh, and search for this data, it's gonna be stored on these chips here that you can see in the picture on the left. Um, and instead of having to search for this data, it instantly can find the data um, because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to search for it. It knows exactly where it's at and it's stored on a chip. So. Uh, you know, the, on the left, obviously, that's what it looks like without the cover on the right. It's got the cover on it, and that's what it's going to look like if you get one. Uh, but basically, you can get these SSDs, and you can uh, transfer your data directly over, either with, like, software, or you can buy, like, a, a hard drive, uh, like a physical device that'll transfer your data for you. 
Uh, and that's what I use most of the time when I do these. Um, but yeah, it's a great, you know, it's a great way to get your computer going quick, even if your computer's five or six years old, you know, there's uh, this notion, people think that anytime their computer slows down that they just need to get a new computer. Um, that's obviously not the case. You can always go in there, clean up all your computer stuff. Uh, you know, you can pretty much do it yourself. You don't even have to pay anybody to do it. Um, you know, if all else fails, grab an SSD, throw it in there and you'll be good to go. Uh, yeah, and, and with that, I I think if you guys follow those steps, um, I think you'll be a lot happier with your computer and uh, that'll get some of you guys stuff going quicker and I think you'll be good to go. Does anybody have any questions or? That's excellent. What a clever uh, topic and um, some really helpful tips. What, when you when we say that, uh, that people often will think their computer's too old, you know, once it starts mm -hmm. to get slow. At what point is it too old, would you say? <laughs> um, it, too old is gonna be, so whenever I generally do them, if it's older than like six years, generally that's a little too old, but it really depends on the processor. So if the processor is like at least an i3 processor, then it's gonna be fine. Okay. Um, so as long as it's like an Intel i3 or higher, then I would put an SSD in it. Um, mm -hmm. And anything newer than like four years is going to be fine regardless of what processor's in it. So, Awesome. What would be the process if you have a Mac computer? A Mac? Um, so if you've got a Mac, it's going to be you know pretty similar. You want to check for viruses. And, and with Macs, you don't really have to worry about it, viruses as much as you do with Windows PCs. They've got a really good built-in antivirus. Um, but as far as the hard drive goes, you know, if it's an older Mac, they do still have mechanical hard disks and you'll want to go in and just transfer your data onto that SSD and uh, get it installed. And, and you can just buy those, um, you know, those uh, mechanical like data transfer things on Amazon. They're like 30 bucks. Uh, so it's, it's really worth it. You're going to, you know, you're going to pay a lot less doing it yourself than you are uh, giving it to somebody like me to do it for you. So. <laughs> You're expensive. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jeremy. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. All right, Anna Wilson. We can see it. Um, so my name is Anna, so I'm going to talk about the importance of hand washing. I chose this topic for two reasons. First of all, since I'm a nursing student, I feel like I'm constantly washing my hands, which is a good thing. But the other reason I chose this subject was because we're in the middle of a pandemic right now, and I think it's important that people need to know the importance of why we're washing our hands. So this was a statement that I found from the Department of Health and Human Resources, and it says, a number of infectious diseases this can be spread from one person to another just by people These include GI infections such as salmonella, which can be and respiratory infections such as influenza. Also, for respiratory infections, it's obviously COVID-19. It's a respiratory infection that spreads by droplets. So here's the question that you should kind of think about during this whole presentation. So if the number of infectious diseases are caused by improper hand washing, would you want it to be find it important to actually wash your hands? So just kind of think about that throughout this whole thing. So here are two pictures. The picture on the left is just of one person's hand, what it looks like before they wash their hands, before they after they wash their hands with soap and without soap. And we used a UV light to look at the hand and to see all the different types of bacteria on the hand. So what was interesting is just on one hand, there is two to 10 million pieces of bacteria, just on one hand. So you have two hands, obviously, so you're doubling the bacteria. So before washing your hands, you see in the top left corner that it's completely covered in bacteria underneath the fingernails, it's everywhere. And then we see after six seconds with just washing with water, no soap, that you kind of get rid of some bacteria, but it's not really going away. And then you see after 15 seconds, the bacteria is getting better. It's kind of more regionalized to the fingertips, which is better. And then 30 seconds with soap and water, you see that the bacteria is just pretty much at the fingertips. So what people don't understand about hand washing is that just because you wash your hands doesn't mean the bacteria goes away. We have 
have to thoroughly wash our hands underneath the fingertips, between the fingers and everything so that you really get the bacteria taken away. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So on the right side, you see the importance of hand washing using a Petri dish. So a Petri dish grows the medium of a bacteria and the dish will harbor the bacteria and you'll see it growing. So you see what an unwashed hand, all the different types of bacteria that's sitting on it. So when people go and touch different things hundreds of times a day, the bacteria obviously spreads. And if the bacteria has a medium for it to grow on, it's gonna keep spreading. So then you see in the middle what a rinsed hand looks like. It kind of gets rid of the bacteria, but it's really not effective enough in removing all of it. And in the little last Petri dish, you see what a fully washed hand looks like. You can see that the, most of the bacteria is pretty much gone and just a little bit resides. It's impossible to get rid of 100% of bacteria because some bacteria is actually good for you. Your body needs good bacteria, but most of the bad bacteria is gonna be gone after you wash your hands with soap and water, which is pretty interesting to think about. So some statistics and data, which I thought was very interesting. 83% of the population actually washes their hands after using the toilet. So that means 17% of people don't wash their hands after going to the bathroom. So that being said, can you imagine you going to shake someone's hand and then they didn't wash their hands after using the bathroom? Pretty disgusting. I wouldn't want to touch their hand. I don't think anybody wants to. So that's something very interesting. Also, female physicians wash their hands after 88% of patient contact, while male physicians wash their hands after 54% of patient encounters, which is kind of interesting. Also, this study was conducted with just normal people. They weren't physicians at all, and there was a correlation that females actually wash their hands more than males, so that was interesting. Um, also, there is 2 to 10 million bacteria located between one's hands, the fingertips, and the elbows. So you have all that bacteria living on you. And if you don't wash your hands, it's not going anywhere. And the longer you don't wash your hands, the bacteria is gonna keep growing and the more and more bacteria comes along. So one in five people don't wash their hands. And of the people that do wash their hands, only 30% use soap. So why would you wash your hands if you don't wanna use soap? That's an interesting question. Some people, I just don't know why they don't wanna use soap, soap and we'll hear why they don't want to. So the importance of proper hand hygiene. So properly washing both of your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds is gonna effectively kill the germs on your hands. So 20 seconds, I know it seems like a long time, but if you wanna get the bacteria off your hands, 20 seconds is the recommended amount. Hi hand hygiene is important because as a society, we're touching hundreds of things a day, doorknobs, um, you're touching your kids, you're touching your face, which we touch hundreds of times a day. People don't really realize that they're touching their face, but they are. So if you don't wash your hands and you have all this bacteria sitting on you, can you imagine that you touch your face? So where does the bacteria go? It's going to go in your eye, it's going to go in your nose, it's going to go in your mouth, and then it causes a virus and you get sick. And then people don't understand why they get sick, and it's because of the bacteria that is just on your hands. So it's something interesting to think about. So as stated by the CDC, hand washing is one of the best ways to protect yourself and your family from getting sick. Learn when and how you should wash your hands to stay healthy. And I think this is really important, especially now because of COVID. Since COVID is a respiratory illness, after you cough and sneeze, you need to wash your hands because it travels in the air. Just because you didn't sneeze six feet apart from someone, it's staying in the air for a good five, 10 minutes. So it's still gonna land on you. So you might as well just wash your hands just to be safe. So it sounds self-explanatory, but when to wash your hands, there's some things that some people don't really think about in their everyday life. So before eating, just get the bacteria off your hands. Then after you eat, especially if you touch anything raw, and if your hands are gross, just wash your hands. It takes 20 seconds. Of course, after using the restroom, that would be very nice if everyone washed their hands, but I get that's kind of hard for some people. Um, and then after coming home from a public place, so the grocery store, the mall, and actually pumping gas is one of the most, it's the nastiest place for bacteria to grow because hundreds of hands are touching it daily. So you wanna make sure you're washing your hands after you pump gas. After touching the garbage can, carries lots of bacteria as well as after blowing your nose, sneezing, or coughing, and after shaking someone's hand. So these are some of the biggest times when you wanna wash your hands. And all of these are really important now because we're in the pandemic fighting COVID. So if we wash our hands, I'm pretty sure that would, that would decrease some of the amount of COVID cases that we're seeing if we just washed our hands. 
So the question becomes, would we why do we want to use soap rather than hand sanitizer? Not that there's anything wrong with hand sanitizer, but it's not really effective in killing all the bacteria off of your hand. For hand sanitizer to be effective, it has to have at least 60% of alcohol in it. So just because that pretty little Bath and Body Works hand sanitizer probably is not going to clean all the bacteria off your hands. It smells good, but it's probably not containing 60% of alcohol. So that being said, I'm not saying you can't use hand sanitizer. If you're in a public place and you're running errands and you obviously can't hit a bathroom, hand sanitizer is okay. Just don't use it instead of washing your hands. We still want you to wash your hands because soap effectively kills 99.9% .9 of germs on your hands. So the reason why as a society we've kind of gotten lazy about washing our hands it's because people think they don't have time, they're busy, and they really just sometimes don't wanna wash their hands. So we need to get back in the habit of eliminating hand sanitizer in some aspects and more of washing our hands with soap and water. And just using soap and water for 20 seconds, like I said earlier, it's really gonna effectively remove the germs compared to hand sanitizer. Another thing interesting about hand sanitizer is that, we pref that um, hospitals actually prefer the foam hand sanitizer compared to the liquid. The reason why they like foam is it has more of the alcohol present, but it also resembles the same effect of washing your hands because you can actually see the foam on your hands. So people see that and they want to get that off your hands and they want to effectively rub your hands. The clear hand sanitizer, people don't really take in consideration the whole rubbing the hands together effectively. So sometimes they don't really wash their hands properly. So that's why we use foam hand sanitizer in hospitals because it gives you that effectiveness of washing your hands and you can see it as you wipe, wipe your hands. So why 20 seconds? Studies have shown that 20 seconds is the most effective time to adequately clean, clean each hand. So just because we do 20 seconds, it's interesting that any surgeon working in the OR, their scrub in time is five to seven minutes. So they scrub in between their fingertips, underneath their fingertips, all the way up to their elbow. And they do that for five to seven minutes. And then they go in, and nobody can touch them. If they get touched, they have to repeat it all over again. So if you're ever in the OR and they yell at you to not touch them, don't take it personally. It's because they don't want to scrub in for an additional seven minutes. <laughs> um, and also probably scrubbing and rubbing your hands. So really that effective motion, scrubbing your fingertips together is really is what's going to remove the debris and oil off of your hands, which is what bacteria loves. Bacteria loves to cling on to anything. So that's why we like that scrubbing motion. A great way to determine 20 seconds, if you just don't want to count, sing happy birthday two times or one time through, and that gets you your 20 seconds. Um, so here's just an illustration of how to wash your hands. I'm sure we've seen this everywhere, doctor's office and restaurants. Um, so it's just a good example. One thing that is also interesting, after you do wash your hands, studies suggest that you air dry your hands. Don't put it on a towel, because if you think about it, if someone's dirty hand touched the towel, and then you go to touch the towel, you're just putting bacteria back on your hands. So they like you to air dry them. I know that can be frustrating if you wanna get something done and you have wet hands, but just let them air dry. It shouldn't take too long if you let them air dry. So the CDC released this campaign in April of this year, obviously when COVID was at its highest, and it's just their hand washing campaign reminding people to wash their hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, which is important now. So properly educating hand washing. So I'm sure for those of you that have kids, some little kids, they don't like to wash their hands. If they're in the middle of playing and you tell them, hey, go wash your hands, they don't want to do it. They're, they're having fun. They don't want to get up from their game and go wash their hands. So the best way to get your kid to wash their hands is to make it fun. Maybe give them a reward for doing it. Maybe give them a sticker, say, hey, I'll give you a cookie if you wash your hands. But we need to teach them the importance of washing their hands because if they get older and they don't wash their hands, they're more susceptible to getting sick. But also it's just a personal hygiene thing. Just make sure they're washing their hands. So really make sure you're teaching your kids at a young age to wash their hands multiple times a day. And then when they grow up, hopefully they'll wash their hands. So this is a video about bacteria and how it relates to COVID and why hand washing is so important, especially now. You might need to uh, get out of your PowerPoint, your slideshow first. Okay, sorry. Oh, that's okay.
Well, I have the sudden urge to wash my hands right now. <laughs> um, that was a very, very uh, detailed speech. Uh, I really don't have any questions. You covered, anyone else have questions? What games do you think that as a parent that we should use for to get our children to be able to wash their hands? I have a seven year old. I kind of have to pressure him to wash his hands. So what what, what other techniques or uh, things? Uh, okay, that's hard because I've worked in a pediatric office. So we kind of offer them like, they love stickers for some reason. I don't know why. They love shiny things. So offer them something shiny. Um, or just say, hey, come watch dad do something fun or come watch me do something fun. And then maybe offer them a reward for it. Say, hey, you know, if you kind of do it with them, you know, say, how hey, do it with you? And I'll wash your hands with you. And we can do it together. And if they see you doing it, and if you act excited, they're like, oh, okay, dad's excited about this. Let me do it. And then they'll want to act like you because they just want, they want to be like their parents. So if you just make it fun, you know, and offer them something fun out of it, they typically will wash their hands. Um, and also, if you kind of get a little, I hate to say this, but if you say, hey, you don't wash your hands, do you really want to get sick? Like, you're just going to, like, push it and stuff. So, let's wash our hands. Just to say what could happen to them, they might wash their hands. Okay. So I would try that and see if it works. It may or may not work. just depends on the kid. I would try it and just see. All right. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Good job. All right. We have Sienna up. Wait a second. I don't see Sienna. Oh yeah, no, I see Sienna. I'm so sorry. Wait, sorry, my mic was off. No, but you're yeah, you're actually num you're the first one on my screen and I didn't look there. All right. I think I'm sharing my screen now. You are. Well, there you are, yeah. Oh my gosh, sorry, I don't know why it's so slow. Uh, Jeremy can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it'll take a second. That's okay. You want to try clicking, what if you click play from start? Will that work? Um, yeah, I'm clicking that and now it's not working. I think my screen's frozen. Let me try uh, to, yeah. Oh my God, I think it's just frozen right now. That's okay. Maybe, do you think you might need to restart? You have a Mac, can you force quit that? Um, I don't know how to do that. Oh. Hit the apple. Okay. This one? Yeah. I am. It's and it's not doing anything. Yeah, you're frozen. 
Go ahead and click right. the PowerPoint button too there. See if like it's right beside the Apple. See if you can click that. Oh, and there you go. PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay, I hit quit. Oh. That's... It happens sometimes. Okay. And now maybe open it back up again. Why don't we, uh, Anna, Anna Hathaway, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. All right, why don't we let, um, nothing against you, Sienna, no problem, no worries, but we'll let Anna go and then you could get set up and okay. we'll be all set. All right, guys. Okay. Um, okay. Hi everyone. Wait, I have to make sure this is okay. Oh sure. Hi everyone, I'm Anna, um, and today I'm going to do my speech on Lake Sydney Lanier. It has a special place in my heart because I'm looking at it right now, and my family lives here, and this is basically where I spent all my time during quarantine. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about how it was created because it is a man-made lake that was created in the 1950s. And the reason it's called the sunken community will be pretty evident throughout my speech, but a little news flash or a spoiler alert, it's a community that was sank. Um, a little bit of backgrounds of it, but it's the largest lake in Georgia. The surface area is 38,542 acres. It's the shoreline length is 540 miles and the length of the entire lake is 44 miles long. So before it was even known as Lake Lanier, it was mostly a farm made of farming communities. And originally it was gonna be made in, Lake Lanier wanted to be made in um, Roswell, Georgia, but the lo this location was chosen specifically because it had a small amount of infrastructure. So the buying of the land was by the government, which bought it each acre from the families who occupied that area for um, $30 per acre. But just because they paid you for the land didn't mean that it didn't impact the families who were living there. Um, there were 700, over 700 families that had to be moved and the cemeteries had to be relocated, which took a toll on the family just because they had been living there for a long time, for probably decades. There were a lot of reasons for the construction of the Buford Dam and later Lake Lanier, but a couple of them include flood protection, navigation, power production, wildlife refuge, and recreation. So I just added a couple of pictures of some of the animals you'll see commonly on Lake Lanier. And then I also added in this little video of a black bear that was actually seen in my cove and my next door neighbor took this video. And this video actually ended up on um, the news, which was pretty cool. But so then at the beginning of construction, they had the groundbreaking ceremony in the 1950s but it took almost an entire decade for the, for the project to be completed. The, the dam was completed in 1956 and water was began to be let in in 1957, but the lake was not to, at full pool until 1959. So it took up nearly the entire decade. So the naming of the lake came after the construction had already been underway, but it was eventually named after a poet named Sidney Lanier, who served the Confederacy in the Civil War. And this is a picture of the Buford Dam today. It is, it's pretty big, and if you know, if you've ever gone by it, you definitely couldn't miss it. But here's a little video of a drone shot I found on YouTube, and that is cited in my bibliography.
Um, so in this, you can see on top of the dam is actually Buford Dam Road. And then on the other side of that is Lake Lanier. But what you're looking at the river is Chattahoochee River, which is where the Buford Dam is built on. So present day is a little bit different than the farmlands that were there before the lake was built. But now it has 9,629 lakefront homes and 10,615 dock permits issued. And these are actually how, uh, pictures of my house on the lake. And my mom took that picture of her view that she can never get enough of. So a little fun fact is that there's 160 islands located on Lake Simulanier, and each of these um, islands are actually the hilltops of old farmland that were there prior to the making of the lake. And then another fun fact is 2007, the 2007 drought kind of took a detrimental uh, toll on Lake Lanier. As you can see, a lot of the docks are not even in the water anymore and boats are inaccessible, but the picture on the right is actually the old Looper Speedway, which was a racetrack in the old communities. But the picture you're looking at is the grandstands of that racetrack that surfaced during the drought. And then underneath Lake Lanier today is a lot of broken down houses. There's some cars, but it's really dangerous to go down there now because even for divers, you can get stuck easily and it's very it's not very visible down there and I also wanted to add in this because I'm a fan of the Ozark but um, if you've seen the Netflix show this is the house that the show is made in this is the bird's house and also the dock slash boat that is um, on in the show and over to the right side of the dock is also where they have the Langmore trailer park so over the years, Lake Lanier has become more of a tourist spot and the Army Corps of Engineers of Lake Lanier has estimated that there are 11.8 million people who visit Lake Lanier annually. So some of the activities that are common are camping, which there's tons of campgrounds scattered along the shoreline of, of Lake Lanier, which I used to go and visit as a kid. Boating is very common. We'll see tons of boating you can rent as well as jet skis. Lake Lanier Islands used to be just a water park, but throughout the time uh, it turned into Margaritaville and now it has restaurants and a resort on it, a resort that my brother just so happened to get married at. Um, and then there's also a bunch of restaurants throughout um, scattered along the lake, sh the shore of Lake Lanier as well. So if you ever wanted to go grab a bite to eat lakefront, it's a great place to go grab some food or drinks. And then fishing is the last activity I have that is really common during um, throughout Lake Lanier. And there's been very big fish that have been caught. I've never seen them personally, but I have seen pictures of some good sized fish. And I just added this in because I found it really interesting when I was looking up facts about Lake Lanier. This was the only book that came up about Lake Lanier and the history of Lake Lanier. And it really gives you a, an idea of the time before Lake Lanier was there during the construction of it and then post Lake Lanier. And it shows you how it started with farmland and then ended with the beautiful place I like to call home. And my bibliography. And then any questions? Very cool, very beautiful. What's your favorite thing um, about Lake Lanier? Your personal favorite thing? Um, I like to go out on the boat. So my parents have a boat. So during quarantine, that's kind of been my getaway is me and my brother will go out and explore and just find new places because it is really big. You never, you never expect to find something new. We've been here for over three years and every time we go out, we find something we didn't know is there. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you. All right, Sienna. Okay, I'll get it set up right now. Sounds good.
Okay, it's working now. Yay! <laughs> Thanks for being patient, you guys. Okay, so my um my pre my informative presentation is on how to take blood pressure, and um, today I'll be teaching you how to take someone's blood pressure manually using a stethoscope and um, a blood pressure cuff. And first of all, what is blood pressure? Um, I mean, I'm sure most of you know, because most, like, a lot of you guys are, like, from the nursing program or whatever, but in case you guys don't know, um, it's the pressure of circulating blood on the walls of blood vessels. Most of this pressure is due to the work done by the heart, by the pumping of blood through the circulatory system. Blood pressure usually refers to the pressure in the large arteries of the systematic um, circulation. Blood pressure is usually expressed in terms of the systolic pressure, the maximum during one heartbeat over diastolic pressure, the minimum in between two heartbeats, and is measured in millimeters of mercury and above the surrounding atmospheric pressure. And then blood pressure measurement, how it's like measured is um, arterial blood pressure is mostly uh, um, commonly measured via a big manometer, which historically used the height of a um, column of mercury to reflect the circulating pressure. And blood pressure values are generally reported in millimeters of mercury. And for each heartbeat, blood pressure varies between systolic and diastolic pressures. Systolic pressure is peak pressure in between the arteries, which occurs near the end of the cardiac cycle when the ventricles are contracting. And diastolic pressure is the minimum pressure in the arteries, which occurs near the beginning of the cardiac cycle when the um, ventricles are filled with blood. An example of a normal um, measured values for a resting healthy human is 120 systolic and 80 Dystolic and um, the equipment that you'll need for this is a stethoscope and it's a acoustic medical device for listening to internal sounds of the human body. I mean, I'm sure most of you know how to work one or have seen one at least. And um, spig manometer, um, which is right here on the right, these two things. It's the um, thing on the bottom left. It's like that um, the like dial thing and. Um, it's also known as a blood pressure meter, blood pressure monitor, and it's a device used to measure blood pressure composed of an inflatable cuff to collapse and then release the artery underneath the cuff in a controlled manner. And a mercury or um, aneroid manometer to measure the pressure is, also, it is always used with a means to determine at what pressure blood flow is starting. And manual spigmanometer, which is what I'm talking about today, um, are used with a stethoscope usually, and when using the manual technique, it, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, and um, consists of the inflatable cuff, as you can see over here. And um, the first steps to taking someone's blood pressure is um, the blood pressure cuff should never be placed over clothing, and um, should be like on your like open arm, like no no clothing or anything, because uh, that can produce an inaccurate reading. And um, to properly position the patient, um, they should be seated comfortably with their legs uncrossed and the artery used to measure the blood pressure should be close to the level of the heart with the arm supported, usually like on a desk or something. Um, to select the appropriate cuff to go around the patient's arm, um, it should encircle the patient's upper arm like with 80% of the cuff. If it takes more than 80% of the cuff in circle, to encircle the upper arm, it's too small for the patient and it will produce a reading that's higher than accurate. And um, here's a video that I think will help like um, tell you guys the, like, the important parts of taking someone's blood pressure. Oh my goodness. Okay, sorry. I stopped the timer. <laughs> okay, now it's working. There we go. Video will stay in the in the marketing repertoire of Yeti for many years, and we can do that, you know, using the new platform. From marketing perspective, it's great for us because it's it's one location. It's okay. It's showing an ad, right? Yeah, it's like. It and the little skip thing will Hey everyone, okay, it's Sarah Thrids to NurseKorean.com, and today I'm going to demonstrate how to check a blood pressure manually. So we're going to put our cuff on our patient and 
we want to make sure we find the brachial artery. This is the artery we palpate that we'll be using to determine our blood pressure. And it's found in the bend of the arm. So we're gonna find it and it is located here. And we're gonna look on our cuff and our cuff has these arrows. And because this is the left arm, we're gonna make sure that this arrow is pointing in that direction of where that artery is. So you're gonna put the cuff up about two inches above the bend of the arm. First, what we want to do is we want to estimate the systolic pressure. So we want to find that number. To do that, we're going to palpate the brachial artery and we're going to inflate the cuff until I no longer feel the brachial artery. And at that point, when I no longer feel it, I need to make sure I'm looking at this gauge to know that number because that number is our estimated systolic pressure number. Then when I go to take the blood pressure, I'm going to inflate the cuff 30 millimeters of mercury more than that estimated number. Now the whole reason for doing that is because we want to avoid missing the oscillatory gap that can occur in some patients. Not all patients have it, but some. And it's usually patients with hypertension. Because the oscillatory gap is like this abnormal silence that can occur and it will throw off whenever you actually hear that first sound, which is your systolic number. So I'm inflating the cuff by filling on the artery, and I'm gonna note the point where I no longer feel the artery, which is about at the 100. Then I'm going to deflate it completely and wait about 30 to 60 seconds, and then we'll take the blood pressure. So our estimated systolic number is 100. Now I'm going to inflate the cuff to 130, and that, that will avoid missing the oscillatory gap if one was present. So I'm going to take my stethoscope, put it in my ears. You can use the bell or the diaphragm of your stethoscope. I like to use the bell because it's best at picking up low pitch noises. So we're going to place that over the brachial artery, do it lightly, don't fully compress it because you can occlude the artery. Then we're gonna inflate our cuff to 130 millimeters of mercury. And we're going to let it fall about two millimeters of mercury per second. And we're listening for that first sound, which is our systolic number. Four. And we're listening for that last sound. And it was 78. So the blood pressure is 104 over 78. Then once you have your reading, make sure you fully deflate the cuff full of air. And you're going to take the cuff off of your patient, of course. And, okay, and I think she did a really good job at explaining it. Like that's kind of how where I learned because I take my mother's blood pressure sometimes before she got like the um a, like new one that like doesn't like not manually um so that's kind of where i learned how to do it she does a good job explaining that let me go back to my powerpoint okay and the blood pressure numbers and what it means so your blood pressure is recorded as two numbers the systolic blood pressure which she was talking about is the first number it indicates how much um, pressure your blood is exerting against your arterial walls and when the heart beats and then this, the diastolic pressure which is the second number indicates how much pressure your blood is exerting against your artery walls while the um, heart is resting between beats. And typically more attention is given to the first number um, as a major risk factor, factor for cardiovascular disease for people over 50. Um, most people, the systolic um, blood pressure rises steadily with age due to the increasing stiffness of large arteries, long-term buildup of plaque and um, an increasing incidence of, of cardiac and vascular disease. However, either of these um, are elevated systolic or an elevated dystolic blood pressure reading may um, be used to make a diagnosis of high blood pressure. And um, understanding the blood pressure readings, like um, the normal elevated high blood pressure, hypertension, and um, hypertensive crisis is um, first one, the normal one, is blood pressure numbers of less than um, 120 over 80 are considered within the normal range. And elevated, um, elevated blood pressure is when the readings cons consistently range from 120 to 129 systolic and less than 80 diastolic. People with elevated blood pressure are likely to develop high blood pressure unless steps are taken to control the condition. And here are the other two, the other three. Um, 
Hypertension stage one or high blood pressure is when the blood pressure consists of range from 130 um, to 139 systolic. And at this stage of high blood pressure, doctors are likely to um, prescribe lifestyle changes or may consider adding blood pressure medication based on your risk of um, cardiovascular disease. And hyper, hypertension stage two is when the blood pressure consists, consists of rages, ranges 140 not, um, over 90 or higher. And at this stage of high blood pressure, doctors are likely to prescribe a combination of blood pressure medications and lifestyle changes. And the last one is like the most um, intense one and that one requires um, medical attention immediately. And why it's important to check someone's blood pressure and risk. Um, blood pressure is important because the higher your blood pressure is, the higher your risk of health problems are in the future. And if your blood pressure is high, it is um, putting extra strain on your arteries and your, on your heart. And um, if your arteries become thicker and less flexible, they will become more narrow and making it more likely to become clogged up in the future. And um, here's my bibliography and any questions. Thank you guys for listening and being really patient. Of course. One quick question. Um, why do they tell you to uncross your legs when um, you're... Because it'll give it an accurate reading if they're crossed or if like your arm is like, I don't know, like up, like up here or down here. It'll just give it an accurate reading because I'm not sure of the exact like explanation, but I know it will like mess up the numbers a lot. And so like it won't fix it unless you have your legs uncrossed. And it also if the patient is like, like freaking out or I don't know, is really nervous or something, it'll also like make it like the number like way higher and stuff like that. Awesome. Thank you, Sienna. Great job, everyone. You're through with your